welcome to Big Blend Radio, where we celebrate variety and how it adds spice to quality of life. Welcome to the Big Daily Blend, everybody. You know, February is Black History Month, and if we're going to talk about Black history, we got to talk about the blues, and that's what we're talking about today. We're going to Mississippi. We have three special guests joining us, and the first one I want to introduce is Margot Cooper. Uh, her new book is out now, and it is called Deep Inside the Blues, Photographs and Interviews, and that is going to be the main focus of our discussion today. It is a book that, if you love the blues, this is a treasure. This is something that you don't even, you don't want to rush it. You want to read every word slowly, maybe have a little cognac on the side. Um, this is, I, I don't know, one of the most precious books I've ever held my eyes on. Honestly, it is that beautiful. And, uh, you know, we do a lot of author and musician interviews on this show, but this is one of those truly special books that everyone should have. And I encourage you to go to Margot's website. It's margocooper.com. It is out through the University Press of Mississippi with the forward by William R. Ferris. And that's margocooper.com. And that's Margot, M-A-R-G-O. And all the links that I talk about on the show today will be in the show notes, whether you're listening on YouTube, Facebook, or uh, wherever, Spotify, Apple, all that good stuff. But welcome, Margot. How are you? Um, good. Thank you, Lisa. And thanks for inviting me to uh, participate in your show today. Are you kidding me? This book is insane. This is like the Bible of the blues of Mississippi. I can't, I can't stand it. Like I can't stop. Like I, I need like a, a month off or something because this is like a lot of pages, but the photos are incredible. The fact that it's black and white, what's it like? Cause we're, you know, we're all, you know, getting it through PDF and digital form. Is it out like as a paperback or a hardcover? Because hard- I would like, I want like the big book. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's it's out in hardcover, and uh, you know the uh, the editor of uh, University Press of Mississippi, um, Craig said to me, Craig Gill said, uh, yes, you 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 know you're going to have a beautiful book, and they truly delivered and. I worked very hard a number of years. Uh, um, John Souter, who lives in Chicago, we went to, um, we were at school at Art Institute of Boston, New England School of Photography together like 20 years ago. And he's been working on my documentary projects alongside of me. And we, I wanted to make this, the book in both the, in terms of the photographs and the text uh, as good as it could be. This is my way to honor the people and musicians that I've been lucky enough to spend time with in some cases, decades. And um, as I say in the book, uh, you know, I I believe that remembering is a duty. It's a sacred duty. And um, I took, I took that responsibility seriously. And I um, have been proud to be a contributing writer and photographer for Living Blues And I wanted uh, to make sure that more people around the world knew about um, Mississippi and the blues and the musicians who talk uh, in their own words about growing up and living in Mississippi or in a few cases, um, uh, Willie Big Eye Smith, Calvin Fuzz Jones and Luther Guitar Jr. Johnson, who went on to spend considerable time in uh, Chicago and played with Muddy Waters. Mm. It's my honor. (laughs) Well, you also crossed over to Arkansas too, which I appreciate as well. And, um, you know, and and also, you know, photographed a lot of the musicians that were touring in your upstate, you're you're up in the Northeast part of the country. Uh, You you also photographed them there, which I think is amazing because everyone we're talking to on the show today is from up there in New York, New Hampshire, Maine, all of that area. Um, but I also want to tell people that a lot of the photos in this book are also uh, have appeared and been featured in the New York Times Lens blog. And that's pretty I mean, that's epic. And, you know, I, I think everyone that's on the show, I'm going to bring Johnny and, and Lisa on in a second. But we'll, all of us are just like you, your integrity to the musicians in the integrity also that you have for being a documentarian is incredible. Um, we really appreciate it. I do for sure. Just um, that you're allowing, uh, you know, these musicians to also have their own words 
and be who they are. It, it's something very special. And it's a treasure. Your book is a treasure for sure. Well, thank needs, you. needs to be in like schools. Like, honestly, I, I want this to be part of black history. And I want to tell everyone too, which I didn't tell anyone um, because like, honestly, I just decided we need to do this. I'm going to create a blues playlist of music to go with your book. I don't know if you have one, but I'm doing one on YouTube and Spotify. So that will also be linked in the show notes. And all three of you on the show today, if you want me to make sure it'll be all musicians that are featured in uh, the book. Also, I'm going to have to put one of Johnny Mastro's in there, you know, because, you know, never trust the living. Right, Johnny? Johnny's <laughs> here. <laughs> We've missed Johnny. Johnny's been on our show for years. In fact, he's been on how many covers of our magazines, even back in the day of when we were in print. Uh, we first met Johnny Mastro and the Mama's Boys out in Long Beach. Well, actually, it was Venice Beach, right? Venice we Beach, yeah. Beach. Yeah, Venice Beach, yeah. And we were all behaving. Nancy and I were behaving <laughs> and stumbled on this amazing music and uh, went in there and fell in love with Johnny Master and the Mama's Boys music and uh, Johnny and the band and his wife, Lisa, see so are just amazing people. And I encourage you to go to the website, johnnymastro.com. Johnny Master and the Mama's Boys uh, perform out of New Orleans and will be on tour soon. And I believe a new album is in the works, right, Johnny? Yeah, you got it. With uh, we're doing a collaboration this time. So, yeah, a friend of ours that uh, Ian Siegel from uh, the UK, and he came over to New Orleans, and we did a, a week, and uh, hopefully, I'll finish mixing it next week. Sweet, sweet. And you've been doing yeah. some radio work too over the years too. I get to tune in once in a while and hear you DJ. It's cool. Yeah, I DJ at WWOZ uh, in New Orleans, ninety point seven FM. I do a blue show two o'clock in the afternoon. It still blows my mind that I can get on on the air in the middle of the day and, and play the, the blue, the music that I love. And a lot of these people that, that are in Margot's book, actually. Yeah, exactly. So you're going to give me some like pointers on this playlist, right? Well, it's going to be hard. I tell you, because she's got uh, some of these guys are, are, are a bit obscure in, in, mm. in a way, you know, great musicians, but so it's going to be, you know, you're going to have to search out some of them. I think, I don't know if Margot would agree with that. Margot. Yeah, I actually, a friend of mine who's a DJ up here, um, my friend Rick Roth, he's going to, he was working on a playlist as well. Um, but, you know, let me know if you have trouble um, with, you know, finding, uh, finding yeah. music for any of the, any of these musicians. But, um, I, you know, I, I consider myself, like I said, very lucky to, I've met each and every one of the individuals photographed or um, interviewed in my book. Oh, man. I think we're all a little jealous. I am. I mean, Pine Top Perkins, you kick off with that, too. And I'm like, dude, Pine Top Perkins has, like, been a hero of my life. Like, I just have always, his, his piano playing and just the way he just slows us all down that. But you're going to sit down and listen. You can't. Oh, yeah. I, yeah. I mean, I you know, the... You know, I unfortunately I was in law school and and um, working as a public defender in the '80s when a lot of uh, great blues musicians were coming through Boston and the New England area. But in the '90s, there were still, um, as you can see in the book, uh, lots of great musicians, lots of venues. Um, happy to have the musicians. Coming to the clubs, the first House of Blues um, started in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, Harper's Ferry and Alston brought in musicians, particularly in February, um, from all over. And in several several of the photographs in the book, um, including photographs of like Bo Diddley, um, Robert mm -hmm. Jr. Lockwood, were taken at Harper's Ferry. Um, Johnny Dees was a number wonderful venue where lots of the musicians um, came through. But I, so in the 90s, um, I started photographing 30 years ago, going into the clubs. Uh, as I said, I was a public defender. I'm, I never had time to do uh, anything else when I was a public defender. But then I started my own practice focused on um, juvenile court cases, representing oh. parents and kids. Awesome. Um, abuse and neglect cases, so on and so forth. But anyway, Muddy Waters tribute band would come through, uh, came through on a number of occasions. And that's how I met like Willie and Calvin and Luther Guitar Jr. Johnson, Pine Top, um, 
And as we know, we were very lucky that Pine Top kept playing through into his 90s. And I did see him at King Biscuit, you know, and in his uh, last performances. It's amazing. It's amazing. Uh, Johnny, as a blues musician and a DJ and someone I know that I, I could, you know, he's been on our shows of all kinds of craziness, too. Our, our old school <laughs> live shows, like crazy, right? They were wild. And they were wild. And, and we're, you know, it's still got that element somewhere, you know. But um, you, I don't care what I ask you. Like we have this, like our, our one friend, Mike Guardi comes on in military history. I don't care what I ask him. He has this answer. Like he knows his history so much. And I think that you're one of those people of music. And I don't care if I'm asking you about Led Zeppelin or Fleetwood <laughs> Mac or something, you know, it's like Johnny knows his music. Going through Margot's book, what what were your feelings as a, especially as a blues musician? I, do you share that feeling I have about the integrity that she she put into this? Yeah, I mean, there's. Uh, I've read a lot of books, and uh, this one has a real honesty to it. I think, and I just that made me come up with some questions for Margot, if that's all right. But I was really blown away, Margot, with the both the pictures and the interviews. The interviews are very different than than you know. Usually, there's this kind of cookie cutter questions for the musicians, and you start seeing the same story over and over. But with this one, each person had like a somehow you got out of them. Uh, like their their own story, and uh, especially with the racism thing, it, it seems like they weren't afraid to talk about that. And I was curious if if you had to uh, coax them uh, along the way, or did this just happen naturally? Well, so the way I um, uh, worked on my stories for Living Blues, um, you know these because I live up north, you know, I would go to Mississippi, I would spend time in Mississippi several times a year, but it really required um, often years to complete a story. I decided from the very beginning that I only wanted to write the stories from with the musician's words, which also takes more time because I wanted to make sure you know, I accurately recorded and wrote what they had to say. So um, relationships were built, you know, um, you know, our work on the stories, as I said, was over, would be over years. In some instances, you know, I had met the musicians and was dialoguing with them before I started interviewing them. Um, But we would, you know, I have to look at each interview, but my notes Um, You know, so I met with each person many times. I would come back, I would record, come home, transcribe, um, go back down, sit down. We'd go over what I, you know, what I had written, make corrections, additions, keep recording. So this this would happen over a number of times. And um, I also was interested um, you know, so again, I wasn't interested. I didn't want to do it like, what's my take on somebody? I wanted them to tell me about their lives. And we would start with, who are your parents, your grandparents? Tell me about your childhood. Um, tell me about what was it like, you know, you know, whether it was the schooling, sharecropping. And, you know, through those stories, um, yeah, people would share uh about segregation, discrimination, and in addition to talking about who they were listening to on the radio and when they were children and, you know, through their uh, adult years. So um, I think that was how trust was built. And so I say these were these were relationships that I cherished and treasured. And also, I, I say in the book, these the people I interviewed were my teachers. I didn't come from this. So, you know, and I also say, like, as a public defender, you learn to listen, Mm. you learn to shape a story, you learn to advocate. And here I, I, you know, I was like, I just thought I was the luckiest person in the world, whoever I was sitting down with and, you know, visiting them at their home. I would stay over it with Sam Carr's and uh, with Sam Carr and Doris. I stayed over with Elsie Omer and I would go when I stayed at Elsie Elmer's house. So I was so lucky. I would go to sleep as he would play whatever he felt like playing, you know, his guitar, um, his banjo, 
uh, whatever. We we just share, you know, it's like we shared our lives together. I might drive with, you know, drive with people, looking over where they used to live, meeting old mm. friends or other people that contributed to their story. And I always remained um, friends with, um, if a story was finished, I would keep going to their shows, keep visiting. And um, yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. And because you, you obviously the listening part of it, but just also just relaxing into it and, you know, letting things unfold. It's, it's special. I, I want to bring our, our next guest on here, Lisa Evans. Uh, she's a travel writer, photographer, big blues fan. <laughs> big blues fan i know because every time she's on big blend radio with us she's on our shows all the time normally talking about travel but if she can dodge off to anything blues she is uh she focuses a lot on coastal mississippi and wrote the book 100 things to do in coastal mississippi before you die her website is writer lisa.com and readypress.com is where you can get her book but lisa welcome back how are you doing good how are you Oh, doing good, doing good. Uh, going through and hearing these stories, and this is your backyard that Margo, you know, this is the backyard and your people that you're surrounded by. Um, you've got to have some appreciation for Margo's Deep Inside the Blues book. Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, first of all, the, pho- the photographs are, are stunning. I mean, I, it, you can look at a photograph and you, it's like you feel everything that it, it it's just, they're just stunning. So um, kudos to you on those. And you can really, like I said, picture, a picture's worth a thousand words and, and yours are absolutely stunning. I honestly, I'm so glad that Lisa brought up about whether it's hard, hardcover or something, because I want one for my, for my uh, home and for my coffee table. <laughs> so <laughs> it, I, I, I want, I want one so everybody can look at it, but Yes, I, I am. As Lisa said, I'm, I'm big into the blues. I, I actually, st- I don't know, stumbled upon it is, is the right word. But again, I'm, you know, born and raised in central New York and I've been on the coast now for, I think it's up to, I think it's um, 11 years. And, you know, I, I have always enjoyed all kinds of, well, most, 90% of all, all the French genres of music. There's a couple that I'm, I'm not real into, but, um, for the most part. And, and, you know, my interest in blues just started, you know, once I got to coastal Mississippi and, and going around, obviously, um, we have a hundred men hall down there and that, you know, just seats the blues. And that's how I actually got started into it. And then the Mississippi blues trail, which somebody approached me to write an article about the Mississippi blues trail. So, okay. Naive me think, okay, yeah, this is easy yet yeah, wrong. <laughs> it's probably going to take me the rest of my life. Um, just, to, you know, cause each, each marker has a story, and and I I um I was reading some of the the people that you mentioned, and I have so much homework to do. I mean, I recognize a lot of the names, but there's a lot that I don't. And I'm like, okay, well now I got to go research who they are. Um, but the trust that these people feel for you and your work, and the, you know the love that you have that you you put into this book, is that to me is very evident. I, I don't think these people would have told you their stories as deeply and as intimately as they did um, without that deep level of trust. I mean, trust is something that, especially sadly in Mississippi, um, you know, a lot of African Americans may not necessarily have. Um, it just is, it's the climate, it's, it's whatever. So the, you know, these people obviously had a great deal of trust in you and, and I think it's just wonderful. Ooh, that's a good point that you bring up about maybe because, you you know, Margo, do you think that coming from out of state helped in that? And the fact that you did go to blues events in your area upstate, right? Or I should say yeah. up northeast, however you want to say it. <laughs> Obviously, you've not spent that much time <laughs> up there. But, you know, do you think it helped in a way? Because I found from Nancy and I traveling, like pretty much our whole lives nonstop, Right. When you're the newcomer, people are curious in you, you're curious in them, and there's this, you can bridge gaps quicker sometimes being from a new place, and also maybe not being a permanent resident helps in a weird way. I don't know how to explain it, but it kind of helped me in in my whole life. Like in school, I went to 16 schools, and mm-hmm. um, yeah, Johnny, remember I got put into, you know, K 
Catholic <laughs> nun school thing, you know, um, after getting <laughs> kicked out. But anyway, that didn't last very long. But my knuckles feel it today. <laughs> I swear to God, man, whatever they did to my knuckles, like, you know, nuns, stop <laughs> it. <laughs> no, they nailed me. But there's something about being that you're not walking in with the baggage of the state. I, I mean, I guess I can only speak to my experience. I mean, when I, I, you know, after listening to the music up north and meeting some of the musicians, talking to them, it was clear, you know, I didn't, it wasn't well thought out, but it was just like, I need to go to Mississippi. Um, you know, what are the, what are the stories behind the music? And, you know, I just, I just went and I started going in 1997, you know, so it's been 26 years. I didn't, the only person I knew in Mississippi was Calvin Fuzz Jones. Um, and, you know, when I flew in, I visited Calvin and his mother happened to be there. So that was beautiful. But, you know, I, um, I, I just went, uh, I've, I've always traveled by myself. Um, you know, I think I would share my feelings and enthusiasm with whoever or an interest, whoever I met from day one. It's like, um, and walking, you know, I, the first, the first night I was there, I went to the small festival at West Point. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's establishing, you know, it's how you communicate with people. And as I said, I'd had six years as a public defender and I've been working as a lawyer. I've only basically done court appointed work. You learn, you know, you know, um, it's um, it's important to do the best job that you can to be an effective communicator and listener. So anyway, um, I had uh, spoken with Dr. Joe Stevens before I went down and the next day he took me to Annie Eggerson's home, you know, Honey Boy was playing, mm. and um, the editor from Living Blues, David Evans, drew me a map and said, you know, I asked, where should I go tomorrow? And it turned out to be the Oether Turner picnic. I didn't know wow. anybody there, and it was um, his daughter, uh, Bernice, you know, greeted me. There wasn't, uh, there weren't a lot of people, and, you know, you just, you just let people know how grateful you are to be there and show enthusiasm, dance, clean up, whatever is necessary. And I just, I started going to Oathers every year and, you know, it, I would, um, Bernice's kids were young. I would visit when I was down in Mississippi, bring pizza, you know, we'd have pizza with the kids and her, and I would go to the picnic and then, you know, I would stay and clean up if they needed help behind the booth. I would sell things, you know, you just, you just become a part of people's lives. Like Sam and Doris mm -hmm. you know, wanted me to stay over. You just, you know, you're just happy to happy. I mean, Jesus people, I it was, a, it's been a very, very beautiful experience in every way. What about the spirituality and the religious side of it? Because, you know, to me, when I listen to the blues, there's like, it just, you know, there's gospel blues, right? And gospel music. And at the same time, it just is like, I, I, I don't know. The blues to me is as close as you can get to God or whoever or whatever I, God I, is to anybody. I, you know? I agree with that. I yeah. mean, it's, it's like true. It's, it's like you're raw. It's just, it it's is, it's life. It, yeah. It, it, it is. It can be sexual. It can be spiritual. It can be all of it. You can have both at the same time if you want. You know, it's, Johnny, I know you've written some of those, but isn't it, you know, with that in your book, you show that absolute, um, you know, ah, how do I say this in, in, when it comes to music, like when you see like an audience let go and you had some pictures in there where you could see people just let go and be themselves and not care. And I think that's the, in, when to be able to capture that beyond the, uh, the intimate conversations and, and portraiture that you did with the musicians, but for the audience to just not care and be that. And I think that's what juke joints were about, man. There was just like, it is get down, get, you know, you're going home in, in some way. And there it just you did that so well too because it it's a little bit of everything but there's a spiritualism in there and there's a freedom 
in some of the pictures that you did there were just that made me made me feel at home in where how I was raised in Africa and and part of it was in the bush with dance like true tribal stuff like I lived with two different tribes as a kid and so that was part of our lives is you know I got always laughing you know just even that I was raised to and taught to stick my butt out I know this sounds really weird (laughs) but it's not I was you know and to this day my my posture is a little off but if you know for a white girl and over there it's like you stick it out and you get down and I learned that from a very young age and when I was going through your book you brought me home to my childhood of that as a little white kid in the bush in Africa (laughs) and I was just like there's this freedom that sometimes I think we forget to have um and and it's wild when you think about you know slavery and you know, racism and everything that our, you know, our black people here in this country have gone through, but you show that. I can, again, you know, I, I, um, uh, photographed and wrote, uh, for what I experienced and what people shared with me and in my experience and, you know, some of the, of course I have a lot more photographs that are in the book, but you know, there was a joy there was a joy mm. in listening to, there was a joy from the musicians and playing the music, yeah, yeah. a joy in singing, a joy, you know, with the audience dancing. And, um, you know, so with my photograph, I would, you know, I would say to myself, you know, I'm dancing with my camera. I'm dancing with the people. Oh. I would dance at times mm-hmm. holding a camera in one hand and, and just dancing. And, you know, you just get, you have to, to be close to people and, and, you know, if you're making contact, you're smiling. And again, I'd been, I, I, you know, these relationships were over years, you know, some people knew me Um, and uh, yeah, just get, just get close, be part of it um, so that you're one with what's, what, what's going on. We call it having the wiggy butt. You gotta have the wiggy butt, right, Johnny? Yeah. Come on, you know that. You know what I mean about the wiggy butt, right? No, I, no, I don't. I can't. Oh, come on! <laughs> I have no idea what you're talking about. I know. Come on, out in the bush. What? What? I don't know the what bush. you're talking about. You, you I can on. guess. That, what, I know. No, listen, the wiggy butt. You know now. There's always a squat dance at the end of the night. You know, someone's doing the squat dance at the end of the night of the gig, right? You know it. It's coming. But um, <laughs> squat dance and wiggy butt. Listen, oh, it, it's about your tail feathers. You got to shake it. It's important. <sighs> Everybody needs to. And if you don't shake your tail feathers, you know. Well, you, one, it was interesting. Dead. One of the uh, one Save of the interviews. <laughs> no, no, no. I was just going to say. It was interesting because I haven't heard this bit, but I can't remember who it was. Maybe it was uh, Willie Big Eyes, but they were talking uh, when they uh, Margo was interviewing. They said that the blues music was freedom. It was an expression of freedom. And I hadn't really thought about it like that too much. And the other yeah. thing that sticks through is um, the close uh, relationship with the church, of course. You know, so it's 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 interesting to hear these guys. Almost everybody. I didn't get through the whole book yet, but most of the interviews I read, they'll they'll talk about the church. And uh, that goes way back, you know, when guys would go like, you know, a son house or, or uh, Charlie Patton, they would go back and forth between preaching and playing the blues. And it's very much alive with these stories um, that she got. So, but I had a question for Margo, if it's okay. Um, yeah. Out of all these interviews and, and pictures, do, do one or two of them stand out more than the others? I'm, you know, I loved everybody that's, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's like uh, children, know. probably. You can't you pick a favorite, maybe. <laughs> um, you know, I, you know, yeah. I mean, I, again, each person was was special to me. And, um, and I try to really, you know, um, you know, uh, the, the the pictures I wanted the pictures to be strong for each person and you know so that the reader who you know may not know you know these musicians could get a feel whether you know as you can see through the book there might be a picture of somebody performing but then there may be you know there's offstage pictures right so that you could you know 
you know, have some sense. And in some of my pictures, like um, I was Luther Guitar Jr. Johnson was my friend. Um, you know, that's there's like a 20 year, you know, period of, right. of photographs. I tried to I, I think that was important um, with many of those, uh, you know, Fred, Robert Bilbo Walker, Eddie Cusick, um, so many of the musicians, um, you know. Um, yeah. So, no, I, I each each story, each person was special and um, I'm grateful for every experience I had. I was going to say, like Lisa Evans, Lisa, I think you and I share this and in, in- maybe not with Johnny, but the two of us are going, we found out a bunch of blues musicians we had no clue about. And it was oh, that absolutely. part of it. Yeah, I mean, it's, that was part of it to me. I'm like, Oh man, see, this is a rabbit hole book and you can't finish overnight. Right. Everyone. So when you get it, it's like, three, it's like a page a day book. And the fact is you pick up, read the beginning, get an understanding. And then there's different regions and everything, how the book is divided. But I mean, it, it just, it, this is one of those things that you could just have a story a night kind of thing with this book. Um, and I'm with Lisa, have the, I want the hardcover too, but it's hard in a car, but other people can do it. Um, I, I love it, but Lisa, you mentioned like there's musicians in there none of us know about probably. Um, and I think sometimes with the blues and Johnny, I'm sure you run into this too. That it's, you know, you know there's always B.B. King, right? And you got B.B. King, you got Buddy Guy, my my dude. I love my Buddy Guy. Ooh. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I when in the beginning of the book, you had Buddy Guy in there. I'm like, dude, I was just talking about him for Polka Dot Day. <laughs> well, listen, he did that for his mom. He wanted a, a Cadillac that had polka dots and drive it up for his mom, right? You know, this history of Buddy Guy to me is just honestly honest to god like i know muddy waters is big for you johnny but buddy guy's my dude seriously <laughs> there's yes. nothing wrong with buddy guy yeah. buddy guy and didn't got... he just didn't he just celebrate a birthday like yeah. well into his 80s or something yeah, i yeah. mean he's and he's still playing and he still sounds just as good i mean it's it's awesome but he yeah there's badass. there's definitely there is definitely a lot of people that I'm going to have to, you know, now that it's like, especially the ones in Mississippi, I, obviously that, that holds a little bit, you know, um, closer to my heart now that I've, I've kind of delved into this, but definitely some that I'm going to have to, you know, look up and, and look into further, you know, when I head up into the Delta and up into Clarksdale and mm-hmm. my next time around. So. Yeah, exactly. That's the thing. And, by the way, Louisiana uh, just did a new plaque for uh, like a, a historic sign marker for Buddy Guy because he's from there. Everyone's important. And everybody needs to listen to Sweet Tea for the rest of the day. But anyway. Sweet Tea. <laughs> um, <laughs> Sorry. Talking listen. About I, that's I, a I good just, album. Uh, I was lucky to see Bobby Rush two uh, nights oh. recently. So we're talking about so you want to celebrate um, a blues musician who's uh, – or as Bobby says, an entertainer who's still performing today. Um, mm-hmm. Bobby's on the road as we speak. I know he's got a couple of gigs at the Lincoln Center in New York with Shamika Copeland, but I saw him at uh, Jimmy's in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and then the next night at Bull Run in Shirley, Massachusetts, and he was mm. fabulous. He was on his feet singing, dancing, talking, playing the harmonica, for a straight hour and a half. Um, yeah. You, you mentioned Shamika Cope. Go ahead. You mentioned Shamika Copeland. I love her show on um, Sirius. She's got her, when she, you know, she has a, she's a DJ on Sirius. And she actually was at Ground Zero in Biloxi, oh, I don't know, several months ago. And that was a great show. Mm. Yep. I, I saw her in Colorado, in Greeley, Colorado, up in cattle country. At a blues, they have this blues festival that is insane. With the Larkin Poe, um, there was a Watermelon Slim, I think was there. Mm-hmm. Mr. Mr. Sip, Mr. Oh, Mr. Sip. Sip. Yep. Mr. Sip was there. It was incredible show. And it was amazing because you could see one stage and when the performers were done, you just turn your chair around, which who was sitting anyway? It's so stupid to sit. Um, and, but then you see the next band, it was crazy, but she, she was the headliner for the show 
And your yeah. your photo of her was like this. She was still like a little bit of that innocent look, but not. You know she was I mean? young. Still, young, that young was girl. Her father was sick. Her father was supposed to play that night at the House of Blues, and he wasn't feeling well. And that's Shamika took to the stage. Oh, yeah, I was sure. lucky enough to see Johnny Copeland, um, you know, in uh, New England a couple of times. So, um, wow. she was with him at that at that stage um, of life. Hmm. Johnny, right. I know you got more on, up your sleeve here. I don't want to cross over on that because yeah. I know you, no. got, you got questions. Well, don't feel bad about the names. Like there's several. I'm looking through them now, and I'm I'm can't wait to read it because I don't know who they are. And, uh, oh, and Marco really? does. There's a lot of obscure. Dude. Yeah, it's it's deep, Mickey, man. Mickey this is Rogers is still alive today. Um, you know, he lives down in the Greenville area, and uh-huh. sometimes he's he told me he's still um, Club Ebony, as you may have read in the New York Times or elsewhere. Right. Um, is back, and he sometimes uh, um, plays there. I mean, there's still some great older musicians who are around. Uh, last is Willie year, King still around? Who? Willie King? No, he died. He, he passed, died, yeah. uh, Too many years ago, sadly. But um, Cadillac John Nolden, who I write about, uh, is 96, and he oh. played at Juke <laughs> Joint last year uh, with Bill Abel. I mean, that was it was beautiful he plays the harp and 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 sings and he's right. you know to circle back to the earlier one of our points of the conversation i mean he grew up in the church to you know sang in the church and he sang with his brothers he had a gospel group and then with the the brothers and when they would go to the radio station it's in the it's in the story deep inside the blues his story they would see bb king also down there. And then with one of his brothers, he and his brother would play in the streets of Sunflower. And there were times when they would see B.B. King there also doing the the same thing. Um, yeah, Cadillac played a few gigs uh, last year. Uh, you can find, uh, you know, uh, there are fortunately a few people, uh, older people carrying on. And what's also cool is some of the um, at like Shamika, second and third generations carrying on the music. So right. uh, Willie, you know, Willie uh, Big Eye Smith died, but Kenny Smith, you know, mm. uh, the, is a well-known drummer and he performs every year at King Biscuit in, in Helena. You've got Cedric Burnside, uh, grandson of R.L. Burnside and um uh, uh, Dwayne Burnside and Gary Burnside, RL sons, you know, who are, you know, you can find playing around Mississippi. I mean, of course, Cedric is playing around the world and across the country. Uh, Charday Thomas, Other's granddaughter. Charday has uh, been recording. She's also, um, uh, she last year played in Africa, played in Europe um carrying on that fife and drum tradition so mm-hmm. it's beautiful to witness again some of these uh trent airs uh um uh son of joe airs and joe's alive and trent um recently recorded he and his dad playing so uh, it's 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 really lovely to witness um you know the generations who are carrying it on. And you can also find people like Anthony Sherrod in Clarksdale, who, you know, grew up at, at you know, to, learned at the Delta Blues Museum and played with um, a number of the musicians who passed, but learned from them. Mm-hmm. So, um, I, I love that it, the torch is being carried on. It's kind of like B.B. King's daughter. We had her, one of them on and I think it was Shirley we had on and, you know, like Sam Cooke's daughter. I know she, he's not blues, but like certain ones. The key hookers on our show all the time. And it's like to hear them do something, but it's always got to have, it, it's cool because they bring in their own style too, you know? Right. And, yeah. and it's important to recognize that, that, you know, everyone is different and, and to let them have that space, 
you know, like, you know, mm-hmm. Lucas Nelson from Willie Nelson, like his, his, he's not his dad yet. He's got a kind of that voice, you know, yep. and, but they're their own people. And I think us as listeners have to look at the kids coming in and let them go. Yeah. Thank you for carrying the torch of, of, you know, your, your family, but let them be themselves. What do you think as an artist, Johnny, on that? Because they've got to be able to be them, their own musicians. Well, yeah. I mean, it, you know, it starts out with what you feel about what you're doing with music. And, and for me, it's always been about uh, just taking this music that I love, but not trying to do it uh, like, like they do it, you know? So yeah. uh, I think it's important. And, and, and to me, the, all the great blues artists, they all have their own individual style. Like I'm just looking at this picture of T model Ford right now with this kid. This, this picture is unbelievable. Mm-hmm. And uh, T model just had this uh, certain style uh, that he sounds like himself. Same with Sidell Davis, you know, he's, he had his own thing. So for me, that's the real art in music is taking your personality and your own story and putting it out there in 12 bars or, or whatever it is. So I feel the same way. I, I the other guy I was thinking about when you, you were talking was uh, Hank Williams, uh, number three, yeah, uh, oh, his I grandson like kind of sounds like uh, <laughs> Hank Williams just a little bit. His music's totally different. Mud. Yeah, Mississippi mud. Come on, there you go. You got it. muddy waters, and, and, he, so, and he trashed everybody in the music industry that was screwing things up in Nashville and Texas. Like he just was like he was screwing <laughs> it up. No, but it's true. Like, sorry, it's yeah. True. No, no, no. I'm just I agree with you. So I think that's important to bring your own thing to it, and that's what all the great blues artists do. Uh, they seem yeah. to have their own style. Well, I just kept it Mississippi mud. You got to bring it in there. Um, the other thing too, you also go into some of the history. Um, you've got that famous bridge there in your book and get into the history of Emmett Till. And I want to say thank you to our National Park Service has now actually recognized that history. And we have a National Park historic site through the National Park Service now, um, to recognize the history of Emmett. And you went, and went a little bit further into the roots so people would understand with that. Uh, Margo, do you want to tell us a little bit about photographing that bridge? Because the bridge, even the way you've done it, where it's, in, oh, it's got a cold vibe to it. Well, I, you know, there's uh, now, you'll have to, Lisa, because um, I can't off the top of my head, but there's a center, there's, um, they have, plaques up. I know that I've seen pictures where one of them was had bullet holes in it, and maybe that was at Bryant's, the um, a marker at, at Bryant's, but there are, um, in that area, there's you have to Yes. Yeah, no, here it is. There's an Emmett there's Till and Mamie Till Mobley. Um, this is in, there's two sites. There's, uh, it, there's like a Two sites under the National Park Service. Uh, there's a national monument in Illinois and in Mississippi. Um, so he he had traveled to Money, Mississippi to visit relatives, and that's mm-hmm. when he was kidnapped, tortured, and murdered. And I'm reading this right off NPS site. Uh, if everybody goes to nps.gov forward slash T-I-L-L, you'll be able to see it. Um, but these are, I mean, this is pretty recent. In fact, we were part of shows to help make this happen because it's so important. Um, in my book, Lisa, um, Willie Big Eye Smith talks about walking by Emmett Till's coffin and, you know, oh. the open face coffin in Chicago and the impact that that had on him and other people in Chicago. Mickey Rogers um, knew Emmett Till because they were both um, with family in Chicago, and they both went down to Mississippi to visit family, you know, that was still, that remained in Mississippi. And Mickey talks about when, um, the, you know, after Emmett's um, killing and death, his family sent him right back to Chicago. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, several that, of the, that, that's, I, I remember several. Of staying, um... Go ahead, Lisa. Uh, there's, that's definitely a stain on Mississippi as far as, you know, and, and to this day, 
it was just recently that that it was still in the news, you know, when, you know, mm-hmm. it, it just it's just awful. <laughs> like there, like there's no other word says, for it. Mississippi goddamn, you know. Mm-hmm. Um yeah. you know, I still uh then don't that'll, that's a whole other rabbit hole. Go ahead, Johnny. Yeah, Sorry. you're right there. You're absolutely correct mm-hmm. there. No, well, I was going to say that. I think I remember reading several of them. Maybe it was Billy Boy Honor. Somebody else also mentioned uh, him. And I'm trying to think. It, it was two or three uh, people said that they had in Chicago that they made a point of going to the uh, to the funeral or to the uh, you know the wake and how much yeah. a, of an effect it had on them and the anger that it brought up. Yeah, that was um, that was Willie Big Eyes Smith. Willie Big Eyes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And and that and that's the thing about what's so interesting about the blues. The blues, there's a, there's like a spirituality. There's the sex part. There's the the freedom part, right? And then there's there is blues that has that little bit of like you know like there is the Mississippi goddamn you know Nina Simone kind of <laughs> thing, where I think it has every emotion in the blues. You know, do you feel that, Margo? As, as you know, did you listen as you? put this book together did you listen to music did you listen to everybody like as you were putting this i I wish i i could have uh, spent more time listening to music once i was home but you know when i'm in mississippi i try to you know catch as much music as i can and you know sometimes people would play when i visited um but there's another aspect too of the music which a number of musicians talk about um, you know, how singing in the fields was a way to take their mind off the work, the drudgery of going up and down the row, whether you were plowing or picking cotton and, you know, that uh, you would, um, they themselves might sing um, mm-hmm. or you hear other people sing and that could be you know, Joe Ayers talks about, you know, women, sing, you know, a group of women might be singing and how how it helped just get through the day in yeah. addition to, you know, the other things that we're, we're um, talking about. But that was another aspect of um, the music that was very important and key to just living <laughs> Mm, it is and i think it goes with a heartbeat too man music goes with a heartbeat and so it's like you're keeping you 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 keep moving forward with music you know music does it it just has that no matter what i don't you know it's like you could be having the worst day in your life put some music on and you'll go okay i can keep going i can keep going Mm -hmm. it's like this extra heartbeat i don't know how to explain it other than that it's it's like you're it's like it is. Music is a savior, man. It is. It is everything. <laughs> I think, it I think is that's where people talk about the healing power of music. Um, mm-hmm. Whatever you know, for each person that that may be, and I'm sure we you've all seen it. Where and I have um, some of the older musicians that I knew. How important it was and is to them to continue to get on stage and play and that, you know, provide such joy in when they're in failing health or whatever. Um, in, so throughout the life, the music is, um, is, uh, brings, as I said, solace, joy, happiness, or helps you with the get through, (laughs) The blues that you may be experiencing in the hard times. Losing, oh, and the breakups. Let's talk about the breakups. It's February. It's Valentine's Day month. <laughs> Let's talk about breakups. Like I lost my woman, <laughs> I lost my man. You know. So, so uh, in closing here, I know Johnny. Do you have you had more questions? Uh, I know we're I know we're going oh, over time here. I know. Yeah, Lisa, Lisa, you good? Lisa, tell me if you have to go. I'm I know I'm, I'm good. I I just totally enjoyed listening listening to this and and like i said now i have to find time to do more homework <laughs> i know i love this because she's gonna do i know we're gonna have to have her back on and we're gonna have to do follow-up follow-ups on this i don't know lisa i think we're gonna have to pick you up when we go through louisiana <laughs> and get into mississippi we're gonna have to take yeah, margo's book and then i'm gonna yeah you know but this is the thing oh wait wait 
Johnny, can I step in quickly? Because we talk about the travel part. What about the juke joints? Are we losing them? Because we were There's in that many left. Louisiana. They're going. And yeah. our friend Arlene, you know, she she saw like, you know, um, oh, why is his name escaping me? Blueberry Hill. Uh, I found my thrill on Blueberry Hill. Uh, oh, yes. Um, oh, come on. Yeah, know exactly. Him. Yeah, he played Domino. There. That's, Domino. That's Domino. Thank you. Yeah. And he used to play in these yeah. joints and, and the, all through Natchitoches and down. I mean, I know you, Johnny, I know New Orleans. It's big and got all that music and Baton Rouge and Louisiana. has got its huge culture too, you know, on this. But like these juke joints, I think it's important that you, you have some of those in the book and feature them because they are literally falling down to shreds. Like there's nothing left. And so I, I want people to understand, go see them and just stand there to know what happened. And you can hear the music, play it in your car, play it on your phone, do whatever you can, but like recreate it, like go there. <laughs> it's just, I don't know how you can't play this music when you drive through the Mississippi and stuff and yeah. Mississippi and Louisiana and Alabama and, and the South. Thank God you guys actually have real radio stations that actually play this stuff. Like I appreciate <laughs> it as travelers, but Margo, um, the the juke joints. Tell me about that because you you went to some right and through this and th- this is important that we. I feel like we should be saving them like national park units, like really. Well, that's what I mean. It's tragic. I mean, I you know I I go back to poor monkeys, which you know has been photographed by many photographers. I've seen it, you know, pictures in the New York Times. And, you know, it's falling down and nothing is at the moment, you know, there's a, a blues trail marker, but right, nothing's being done to preserve it. Um, but at also, as I've, you know, gone um, back to the places where some of these musicians grew up, you know, all that, all that history has been erased, torn yeah. down. Mm-hmm where people lived, the churches. I mean, there's still, you know, you can find some old churches, but many have been, um, you know, are, are, are just gone. So there's no marker for where, what happened, where, no, um, you know, what did it look <clears throat> like? I just went back with uh, Mickey Rogers when I was down in October to a couple of places that are in the book and um, Cotton House and and um you know the house the the replica of you know where where he had lived uh those were all gone yeah um, damn it, it is. i went this through some of that thing. with in in natchitoches louisiana that's kind of got me spurred up like you know i like we document graveyards i know that sounds weird but i love graveyards but i would rather we also look at some of these places like Nicholas, Louisiana, you know, there's some of the juke joints and over the years, we've been there for over 10 years now visiting that area. It's the oldest city in Louisiana. And you, when like, they're literally like dying, like they're decimating, like they're just falling down and going down. And then you get to the Elvin, Mr. Elvin, Elvin Shields took us around and he comes from a sharecropper family and he saved his his sharecropper family house, it, which is now part of the National Park Service. And if it wasn't for him standing up, that would have been overlooked. And he took us around to where he went to school, when his church. And I have all these photos like and I don't know, I'm just documenting. I don't know what to do with it all. But like the, he's yeah. like the, the, the it's no one's in these schools, this school or or this church, you know. And um, anyway, it, it, it's kind of crazy when you go like what you've done, Marco. And I, I want to say, Lisa, I think Lisa, you know, both of us as travel writer, people, photographers, we need to get our travel writing community to stop, go off the beaten path a bit. You know, I know we have all these press trips right. and all that stuff, but I think Margo's book shows us it's not just going to like Johnny isn't this true going to the same big fancy club kind of deal we need to go off the beaten path as yeah. on mm-hmm. the tourism community and 
and I'm not saying I, I'm to always talk about responsible tourism. Responsible tourism is about understanding history and culture and nature. Be kind to all. Um, having a light footprint. And we need to start looking at these places so maybe we can save them. You know what I mean? Because if no one's looking at them, and, and I think this is the beauty of Margot's book and the beauty of your book, Lisa, as well, you know, the hundred things to do in coastal Mississippi before you die. I think we need to start as people who travel, get over the big fancy things, you know, it's like staying at bed and breakfast instead of the big fancy thing resort. You know what I mean? We need to change our perception of how we travel and how we do things and maybe look at I, these I, places. I love that. you. I mean, this it's it's like you're reading. I'm I'm actually in New York City because we had a big writers conference this week. And I met with a, you know, whole horde of destinations who, you know, they want you to, but the funny, I mean, the very, not funny, but the very, very interesting part that I find, especially during this conversation is there's always seems to be a buzzword each year when I come to these things and sustainability is it this year. There's actually three that I picked up on with everybody. Sustainability, um, basically, and, and the words literally were spoken probably a hundred times just say off the beaten path. And the other thing that is the buzzword is indigenous cultures. So those are like the three things that, that at this conference people were, but I, I think you're right. I think music, music is a sub, a subtitle, so to speak. And that's one of the reasons that I met with certain destinations is because of my interest in music, not just blues, all music. And I, I love music history. So I have a number of places that that's kind of what I'm going to delve into. So it's it's just really interesting that that's what I've spent the week listening to, and here we are talking about it. See, I know everything. No, I'm kidding. I'm just kidding. But it's the <laughs> truth. But it's the truth because it's like I want to go before the graveyard, right? I want to go before that. And, Margot, what you've done, I mean, you even had musicians stay in your house, right? Am I right? You had a room dedicated in your house. Yeah, uh, Luther Guitar Jr. Johnson. Um, I met Luther in the 90s, and it turned out <laughs> that uh, his, he was living in New Hampshire at the time, and his doctor's were outside the Boston area. So um I I my I practice law in New Hampshire. So I would I offered early on I was I wrote a story for Blues Wire before I wrote it for Living Blues. And I said to him, What's going on with your health? Would you like me to go to your doctor's appointments? And that led mm. to a lifelong friendship and he would stay at my home. You know, I would bring him to and from appointments and then you know, there were times when he stayed with me for days, weeks, and even months. Yep. Mm. Johnny, awesome. any more questions on your side? No, I just, I want to thank uh, Margo for doing this book and uh, doing it so well. I know. Thank you. And one other comment for the audience. So, in, in, in to respond to what Lisa Evans was just saying, or Lisa Smith too. I mean, you, you know, so one of the pleasures of Mississippi uh, you know, that I experienced and, you know, again, things are changing, but that there are still small festivals mm. where you can get up and personal, you know, up and, you know, cl you know, up close to hearing the music there are in, in some instances at the smaller festivals where you'll have a chance to talk to the musicians, meet people from the community you, you know, you find the little restaurants, um, and mm. that's one of to me that was one of the you know been one of the wonderful experiences in Mississippi of um, of of doing exactly that. I mean, it was in um, my first time I was in Greenville at the bait shop, which is you know where they had music, and um, I didn't know anybody, and behind me. Eddie Cusick and his wife were seated and Eddie I can't remember if it was Eddie or his wife came up to me and invited me to sit with them mm. and you know that was the start of a friendship um 
you know, again, until uh, through the time of Eddie's death, where I would constantly visit them or, you know, the, uh, see, you know, wherever he was performing when I was down, I would, I would go there. It's um, so this is a very, uh, it's, it's a wonderful thing, a wonderful, ex you know, experience that is there for people to um, also, they can also experience the same thing that I did. I, mm -hmm. I really appreciate what you say about going to like places and, and restaurants and things and, and mom and pop places, especially in the South. Yep. Go yep. to mom and pop pla places, you know, travelers, seriously, just stop it. <laughs> like it's, it's like, you know, the mom and pop places are where the real things are, and the food is good. Right, Johnny? You know, yeah. it is right. You know, yeah, the, the small places good. are always the best. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and it's like you can talk to people. I mean, it's an opportunity yeah. to talk to yeah. people from the you know from the area. Yeah, it it, it it's just like um, and it's important to support these the, the you know the people who are running these uh, their own luncheonette or restaurants. Absolutely, you know when we got to this country in ninety seven, back when you started your your blues journey, Margo we moved to Florida from South Africa and um, I, I went to some bar out and uh, it was after a hurricane 9798 and it was out in Destin Beach I think we were out in the Panama like the panhandle of Florida and James Peterson was playing uh -huh. Lucky Peterson is his, his son right and he tried to get me up on stage to sing because I was singing <laughs> along with it I was loving everything and, and I chickened out. <laughs> and I'm like, I didn't know who I'd met. I didn't know anything, you know. And then later I was like, you know, my boss at the time, because I was teaching people how to play the organ and musical, musical in organs, <laughs> instruments. And um, <laughs> my boss at the time gave me an album. He's like, you got to listen to James Peterson and Lucky Peterson. And I was like, mm. holy crap, this stuff is good. And... um that's who I met. And I didn't know. I had no clue. And, you know, we, Sam and Dave, the one that's alive, we saw in Florida, like our, our first week into this country, we saw him play. I was like, what is going on? You know, <laughs> it, it, it just go to the smaller places, the mom and pop places. That, if that's where the blues is happening. The local bands go see the local bands and support them. I mean, it's I, whether it's blues or not. It is about that. And and for small mom and pop businesses to host musicians is a big deal. And it's costly for everybody. So be part of it. Be part of it with, you know, the world of, you know, I feel like we're in an MTV culture again in a weird way. <laughs> you know what I mean, Johnny? Don't you feel like that sometimes? And we need to get down and get into the places in the small towns because you'll find music that you wouldn't, it, it just would blow your mind. So everyone, uh, Margot Cooper, keep up with her at margocooper.com. It's M-A-R-G-O, cooper.com. Johnny Mastro is johnnymastro.com. Lisa Evans is writerlisa.com. All the links are in the show notes. I want to thank each of you for joining us on the show today. It's been extra special. I know we went over time, but how could we not? Before you go, in closing, each person, we're going to put on a concert, but we're going to have a dinner first. <laughs> right? We're going to have a dinner right. first. Who do you want to invite to dinner? <laughs> Who are you inviting for dinner? Right? With a concert. We're all going to just have a jam session, which is always the best, right? A blues jam. So, Margot, who do you want to invite for dinner and for the blues jam? Alive or past? I mean, oh, oh, my God. All the people who are in the heavens now, I want I call out to them. Luther, come on down. Uther, come on down. Sam, come on down. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> you guys, Smith, come on down. Fuzz, come on down. I mean, you know, I want them all. I sometimes do. I'm at home and I go, come on, Luther, come on. <laughs> I want to hear you. I, <laughs> and Luther is such a good name, man. So everyone, Deep Inside the Blues, photographs and interviews. That's the book. And uh, she's calling everybody down. So we're going to, that's mm -hmm. a big, 
we're going to have a big ass party, man. That's not just <laughs> there a, you go. That's a, yeah, that's a party. <laughs> that is going to have some wiggy button squat dancing. That's coming. That's going to have to happen. Johnny, who are you inviting <laughs> to the party? I can uh, almost guess. Well, <laughs> this is so hard, but I, I don't know. I have to say somebody like Charlie Patton, probably just because there's so little known about him. And, and Hound Dog Taylor would be my, he's my favorite. So <gasps> no, that would no be, that waters? would be something. Well, well muddy, muddy too, water. but. The, the thing is, we're kind of spoiled now with Muddy. There's video and there's a lot of records mm-hmm. and things, but uh, with like Charlie the Rolling Patton. Stones, like mess it up, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. But but with and some of the older, there's hardly any. In Elmore James, too, there's no video of him. You know, it would be oh. really, really something to see him, you know. Ah. Uh, so those yeah. are mine, I get. I want to bring Terry Evans in. I don't know if you guys know him, but he used to play with Ry Cooter. And he passed away right as I yeah. was in a conversation of getting an interview. And I'm wow. pissed because I delayed. <laughs> I delayed. Don't delay. Yeah. Do not delay. Right, Margo? Do not delay the interview. Uh, no, no, when- no. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, it would be a, uh, it was heartbreaking to me. The number of, I, you know, I wanted to cover as many people as I could and, Sometimes I would think to myself, this is chasing the blues. Paul Wine Jones, I, you know, I said to him, okay, when I, then my next trip, I'm going to interview you. You know, he died before I could do the interview. It's very, you know, especially if you're not living in the place where you're, you know, you're trying to um, interview people. It's very hard. But yeah, there's no time to be lost. Um and everybody, you know, everybody has a story to share. So, um, yeah, yeah. So start, yeah. start yesterday. <laughs> yeah, get going, Lisa. Who, who do you, who are you bringing to dinner in the jam? I mean, party. Oh goodness. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make you happy and and go with uh, Bobby Rush and Buddy Guy. Buddy um, Guy's gotta be in there, see. dude. Come on. He Sweet has deep. to. I'm, and then, I'm of course, if playing that now. If we're bringing if we're bringing people back to the living, I have to say, and and Lisa, you and I've had this discussion. I want Elvis back when he started with the gospel and the soul, and and you know the mm. the you know how he started. And then there's a, a local guy that I really like. Well, local, not not local, local, but his name is Lucius Spiller, and he's a blues guy. I've seen him several times, and he's just he's just very good. I enjoy him. And we got to have Johnny there because Johnny, like Johnny well, Master of the Mama's well, Voice, he, he, listen. He, well, he's bringing and, his own. He's bringing his crew. <laughs> and and the, the best song ever, Indrid Cole. I played this song. Like, seriously, when I have to drive through stuff, I'm watching my language. Like, you put that song on, you can go through any. And if you're going <laughs> to go through Wisconsin, you never know. At night, you never know what's going to get you. It's Just like saying, a novelty song. Oh, God, I love that song. Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm serious. But everybody at johnnymaster.com, writerlisa.com. And again, the book is Deep Inside the Blues, Photographs and Interviews by Margot Cooper. Go get it now. Thank you all for joining us. And man, let's all have a party. <laughs> all right. <laughs> all right. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Uh, have a great day. Yeah, you Thank too. You. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to Big Blend Radio. Keep up with our shows at bigblendradio.com.